Like if somebody needs a new car because their car is worn down or they don't like the way it looks as an agent, like that to me says like, we got a little hustle in there. You need something that you need to work towards or like, I need to get out of debt. Those kind of people are the people that I'm looking for because that was me. I was living paycheck to paycheck and wanted to have a better life. And then once I get it, once I feel like once an agent gets a taste of what the real estate life is, like God help us all because, you know, we're just like, boop, boop, boop. it comes in and then we're like, let's buy this, let's buy this. That's a whole nother show, right? But um, I'm looking for somebody that needs things. You're listening to the number one real estate podcast in the world where we talk with real estate professionals all across North America about the wins, loss, plus the stories of you win in your local market today. My name is Cody from Street, usually joined with Vikram Deal of the Real Estate Sales Academy. Vikram is in a sales training right now. Uh, and uh, yeah, we generally, uh, we should banter. If you listen to the podcast, we're generally banter the first couple of minutes, but we're going to hop right into it. We have a very special guest all the way from. Las Vegas and uh, with real brokers. Uh, why don't you give us a high level overview, Angie, of kind of who you are, how you got into the business, and uh, what you would say is one superpower you have? So, who I am is I have been in the business for seven years now, which is not a long time for a lot of real estate agents. Um, I started seven years ago, I was actually working at one of the fancy golf clubs out here and a broker hit me up to sell real estate. Um, sales has always been my thing, but I didn't realize that I should be selling, you know, instead of bottles and, and lobsters, I should be selling homes because there's a lot more money in that. So after my first year working to kind of transition out of that business into this one, last six years, I've been in the top 1%, top 250 in Las Vegas. So there's about I think 18,000 agents out here. So anybody that is in the food and beverage industry out here in Las Vegas, it's a really organic thing to just move into real estate. And I know a lot of those people do that. So um, since then, just moving into residential, uh, I started running my broker's team, which was last year. And then this year, I now have my own team. And over the last three years, I've been coaching and teaching on lead conversion skills nationally with a lot of different teams. So just here to bring that and to help people get used to being consistent and persistent and saying the right things. Mm. That's where I'm at now. So why don't you give us kind of like, so for people that don't know kind of like your, um, like your team structure, like what, like what is the, what is the structure of the sales organization look like before we like dive into lead conversion and like kind of what you're doing currently in the market? Like, can you give us kind of like a background of like over the last six years, what has the team looked like? Are you a, are, you know, how many, how many salespeople do you have on the team? Is it you? Like what, how, what is the structure of the sales team? Okay. So we'll rewind before I started running my own team. Uh, the Joe Taylor group in Las Vegas, it's a huge team. So when I started running that team, I want to say we went from about 60 agents to 120 agents. So there is a small uh, full-time team, and then there's also independent agents, and they were all working leads. So I was coaching um, about, I would say, just a little over 100 agents for you know the four years before the current year here. So that would be the size of it then. And then uh, last year, we went to a national level, or not last year, in the last two years since we joined Real Broker, we went to a national level. That's when I started teaching teams in different states. So there was about seven of those teams that I was working with. And now just to kind of protect my sanity a little bit more, I've gone down to a smaller level and my team is uh, five agents and we just work, you know, weekly and it's just very hands-on one-on-one with me and my team. And then we do round tables and I've, I've done all that before on a, a much larger level, but now I'm doing it on a smaller level. And then I also teach Zoom classes about twice a month and do an in-person class once a month. And that's why so for anybody. So it's really interesting. So you have perspective when it comes to running a large, like, you know, like being on a large team and then perspective on like on a, on a, uh, a smaller scale, uh, scale. I, I'm curious, like when you said, um, you know, protecting your sanity, I think a lot of people are, uh, you know, they want to drive big, but you know, like what I guess has been 
the biggest transitionary period from you running that large team to like, you know, to you, uh, you know, having a team of the five that you have now, like what, I guess, like, have there, has there, have there primarily, what primarily have been the differences for you? So the primary difference was, let's see, when I first started running the larger team, um, I was closing 37 deals at that time a year. And then, you know, the market shifted and I did over 60 leads in the same year. Plus I was managing that whole team. So that was looking for me at about doing that and my own production was, it, it was like 80 hours a week. And so it was a little bit overwhelming for me because in real estate, we know where we are. <clears throat> Sorry, I had like a frog in my throat. No worries. Um, we, we as real estate agents are therapists to our clients and we're talking to them all the time. So when you add in a hundred agents who you're also trying to help do what you do, that just becomes a really big thing that takes up your time. And, you know, as a, a wife and a mom of two, and I got a dog and a cat and I got a house and all of this, it was just, I was doing it, but it was taking a big toll on me. Mm -hmm. And I was, I, I'm not sure how I was doing it, but I was doing it and everybody was successful and I was running everything, but I kind of hit a wall where I wanted to kind of focused on a smaller level so that I could focus more time on the agents I was working with instead of like trying to spread myself thin and help a hundred. Does that make sense? Yeah. No. And that, and that totally makes sense that, you know, it sounds like at one point in time you had gotten clarity around like what was, um, you know, what was important. Like you said that, you know, you found your, 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 like you're able to find more sanity with the, with the, the structure that you currently have. Like, I guess at what point in time did you, did you, like, was there something pivotal that happened where you're like, you know what, I'm more happy doing the running the five person team versus working on a really large team? Like, like how, because I think of that a lot of, you know, agents out there might be thinking about, you know, is my 20 person team really serving me at a high level? Because I hear this often from a lot of team leads um, <laughs> from really across the country. And I've heard it before where it's like, you know, they've shrunk down their team because they realize that the large team wasn't really serving the the overall vision that they had for their own lives. And it kind of sounds like you went through something like, can you touch a little bit on that and like kind of how sure. you came to that realization? <clears throat> I think how I came to that, it, it wasn't any specific incident that happened, but what I was realizing was that because there were so many people coming to me asking, what should I say to this person? What should I do here? Which I felt like I was falling short and delivering what everybody needed because the kind of person I am, if somebody texts me, even if it's at five, I can't leave it till the next day. I know a lot of agents are able to turn the phone over and clock out. I can't do that. So I was finding myself, you know, kind of getting short with my family or not focusing on my clients, not not being able to prioritize correctly. But at the same time, I didn't want to feel like I was letting anyone down. And at that point where there were so many people and me wanting to help everyone, I would have needed an extra person to help me run everybody. And I kind of felt like I would rather keep being that person, but do it at a smaller level. So you, we, we had chatted in the green room and I asked you the question that you like about what you think, one of your, um, superpowers in real estate is lead conversion. How has your processes or maybe have they changed in regards to lead conversion in this market versus like a 21 market or a 22, like where like everything was just so different where you know, and, and I know that you've been in the business for seven years. So I, I'm curious to kind of like gain your perspective and your insight on what you think it takes in order to see effective lead conversion. Like what are the processes that you're teaching the agents that you're working with in order to see the results that they want to see in their business? Well, so there's, I'm looking at a timeline because now the market is so different from the two years ago. But when I first started, you know, I was starting in a business well the leads are a little bit different from when i started and i feel like i need to get back to what that was so i would sit in the office and call leads that were just kind of forced registration kind of things and i would sit there and call for about eight hours a day and i would have a lot of conversations and most of those conversations i would say the majority of them like 90 percent of them were all first-time home buyers so very similar to what we're dealing with now to where we need to walk them through. We need to tell them what that payment looks like. We need to tell them what it's gonna be like with the lender. We need to dig a little bit deeper sometimes on what their credit score is. 
or what their down payment is. Whereas for the last two years, you could just kind of be like, where do you want to live? Let's get you approved. Boom. It was like, let's go. But back when I first started, you really had to know a little bit more about lending, a little bit more before the handoff was taking place. You had to sit down and meet buyers for a buyer's interview, which was something people were not doing two years ago. There was no point. That was that was standing in the driveway, right? And telling them what was going on. And we weren't even really telling them, okay, here's your this is your earnest deposit. Next is the home inspection. It was kind of like we're going full because we gotta we don't have time to explain this because the house is going to be gone. So right now what I'm trying to do is kind of get back to basics where we're going to have the buyer come into the office and explain the whole buying process because they might not be able to buy right now because the interest rates are high. They might have to wait a few months. So let's build that relationship and get face to face before we just meet them out of the house. You know, there's just a lot more that needs to go into it with sellers too that is different from the last two years. So lead conversion is going to be a little bit more of a massage than it was like, how much do you want to spend and what do you need? as it was two years ago. Now you have to get in there and dig in a little bit more and find out what they actually need and what you're going to do to serve them that way. Yeah, no, and I echo this sentiment massively because, you know, like we we do appointment setting for real estate agents and we can, the real estate teams, and a lot of, we advise a lot of large teams from across the country and they are, you know, these large teams are now like trying to get their agents out in front of more people because the conversation volume with a lot of these large teams we're speaking with, it's like, okay, it used to take us 15 conversations in order to get a, in order to get a meeting. Now it's taking 22. Now we're having to, you know, like take, take a step back and, you know, go to a buyer's consult, go to a, you know, the, even the potential listing presentation. Maybe we need to actually sit down and educate them on the, the options that they have available uh, when they are listing their home. Maybe it's a renovate to sell. Maybe it's an auction. I'm curious to know when you're coaching your realtor. So you have five agents that are uh, that are on your team. It sounds like you know, like a lead conversion, and you know, even like you you being on the phone eight hours a day. When you like, you know, you say getting back to basics. That concept for a lot of agents out there, truthfully, they're like, I could never do. Yeah, like they're just like, I could never do that. So like, what, like, do you think that's fundamentally just a problem with the industry or do you think it's that like, what, like when you're looking for an agent to join your team, like what are some prerequisites that you require in order for somebody to join your team? I would say they have to, they have, it's hard to say a why because everybody's why is different, but what I'm looking for is people that are hustlers or people that just have a really strong work ethic which is hard to find because when you say to somebody, how's your work ethic? Is it strong? Everyone says, yeah, you can't, you can't judge really by the, the first meeting that you have with a person, whether or not they're going to have grit and whether or not they're going to have a strong work ethic. I'm sure that my broker actually, here's the thing. Like when I met my broker, I was out in Las Vegas and it was a hundred degrees and I'm out there on a golf cart and no one's out there. So he's like, this chick has grit. She needs money, you know? So I'm not that I'm looking for people that need money, but one of the questions that I do ask is if you had, you know, four commission checks in the bank, what is the thing that you would want to buy? And if, you know, somebody actually an amazing agent that I just met, what they said was a new car like that right there. Like if somebody needs a new car because their car is worn down or they don't like the way it looks as an agent, like that to me says like we got a little hustle in there. You need something that you need to work towards or like, I need to get out of debt. Those kind of people are the people that I'm looking for because that was me. I was living paycheck to paycheck and wanted to have a better life. And then once I get it, once I feel like once an agent gets a taste of what the real estate life is, like God help us all because, you know, we're just like, boop, boop, boop. it comes in and then we're like, let's buy this, let's buy this. That's a whole nother show, right? But um, I'm looking for somebody that needs things. It's uh, it's necessity and it's, you know, it's, yeah. it's raising, you know, and I love what you say where, you know, it's that minimum standard. It's like that ability to say, okay, I have to do this. It's like the necessity pushes us in order, the necessity pushes us towards success. It's like, if we need something, that minimum standard is like, I need to, I need to accomplish this in order to get this. Like, so no, and I absolutely love that. I love that. Like, 
that's what you look for in in a in a team like walk me th- you, you you do a lot of coaching with your team uh it sounds like walk me through right now what a monday morning or tuesday morning meeting looks like with your team around lead conversion around coaching them towards success okay so our round tables are on wednesday we call them round tables and our team is very close we come in and we work in a really close space we used to work in a big training room now we work in my office because we have to get on the phone and sometimes you know the team doesn't want other agents to hear them on the phone because it can be embarrassing um so we come in and we just we go in with a goal and our goal Every time you get on the phone and you're working on conversion, your goal is going to be between 10 and 20 conversations every day. If you're having 20 conversations, um, a friend of mine, Justin Nelson, you might know him, said if a real estate agent is having 20 conversations a day, they will never worry about money. So it's it's really hard to get to 20 conversations every day. You've got to be disciplined because it can get tiring, especially when people aren't answering the phone and hanging up on you. Sometimes it's hard to get to 10. So we go in with that 10 conversation goal in mind. If we get in the zone and we're having a good day, we can get over that. But we go normally for two hours straight and each agent gets a turn, myself included, and they'll get on the phone with a lead. And if they get stuck, I just whisper to that. I'll, you know, I'll, I'll tell them to put it on pause and I'll tell them what to say. We go through, sometimes they have a lead that they think has blocked them or they're not sure what to say. So I'll take the call. And if it's a woman, I pretend to be them. Or if it's a guy, I can say like, I am Justin's partner. This is Justin's partner, Angie, with the Facebook page. That's another thing. We always say the Facebook page. We never say our company because Facebook is not scary and Facebook is not trying to sell you things where real estate agents are. So we kind of just go turn by turn and then we mark our conversations. And whenever we have a conversation, we're high fiving because that means we're one step closer to our goal. I, I love what you did, the language pattern. Facebook isn't there to sell you anything. And this is, Which is why anyone listening, so we, me and Vikram chatted about this literally earlier earlier today. The reason why Zillow conversations are so much easier is because Zillow has br- built brand equity with the consumer. So the, the reason why, like when Zillow contacts a prospect, and we see this because we also work in the home renovation niche where for the most part, the homeowners are more, open to speak to a home renovator and a a contractor about renovating their home than they are with like selling their home because you know that they're it's more of a consultative approach versus like you know the sale of your home is more of like the sale Mm -hmm. of your home i'm curious on the buy side right now you mentioned you're doing buying consults and you're getting people to come to the office how are you getting these Facebook leads or these uh, inbound leads or whatever lead source, because it doesn't matter the lead source. A lead is a lead is a lead. How are you getting them into the office? And then what are you educating them on when they're in the office? So we're getting them into the office and and it's a lot easier to do with a first time home buyer because they want to hear about it. It's scary. They don't know what goes into it. And what we tell them is you can come into the office and meet with us. Let's sit down for an hour. We can see what's available in your price range. We're going to walk you through everything from A to Z, from when you start looking for houses, from when you get your keys and you close. So once we get them in, we're going to talk about earnest deposit. And we're going to say, quite frankly, like, do you have an earnest deposit? Going to be about 1% of the sale price. Here's the money you need up front. You need earnest deposit. You need money for a home inspection. And sometimes you need money for the appraisal. So you know, the smallest amount you're going to need is probably about $3,000. If we don't have that, we can't start yet. And so they know that, you know, that's a good thing to know because if you've never bought a home, you may not need your down payment and all that. You can borrow that from a family member. You could have that in your 401k, but ultimately to start, you need $3,000. You good with that? We can go on. Yes, I'm good with that. Can I borrow that from my mom? Absolutely. We'll just have to get a gift letter, whatever. And then we walk them through the home buying process and that, you know, we have, for me, I will tell them I work by appointment. So I need at least 24 hours so that I can book your appointments. Then I'm going to send you all the properties we're going to look at. You're going to follow me. And then I'm going to go through each home with you and ask you what you think on a scale of one to 10. So be ready when we go in there, because sometimes you walk into a home and you don't know why you don't like it, but you don't. So let's talk about that. And then we talk about the 
the home ins inspection process and what we're going to ask for and what we don't ask for. And we're going to talk about all the times they can cancel. Then we're going to talk about the appraisal and what happens if it doesn't come in at the right price. And then finally, the loan contingency. And you have to give all of your stuff to Mr. Evil Lender. Just kidding. My husband's the lender. I had to say that. Um, and then finally, getting your keys and what that day feels like. So we just you just want to walk them through everything because they don't know what it's like at all. So if we can get them in there, then we've kind of built that friendship. Sometimes they bring their kids in. We give their kids, you know, some sweets and some crayons and we're friends. And all of that just gives you that opportunity to meet where it's not, you know, a million degrees and there's no pressure because you're in a house and you've ne never met the husband and they're pissed off. They just got off work. It's just a whole different vibe when you have a buyer's interview. Yeah, no, and I and I love the idea of the buyer's interview, the buyer's consult, because there's so many people out there right now that just like are out there with flawed information because they're getting information from mom and dad. They think that they need they more down potentially than they do. They don't. They're not aware of access to different grants that they might be eligible for. So that buyer consult gives you the ability to, in order to give people options. So I love the fact that you're doing that, especially in today's market. What like what are you seeing locally in Vegas that is maybe a tactic that is working specifically for you that you would attribute a large portion of your success to? Like for example, we had a, we had a client on um, I think two weeks ago that does, um, it does like garage sale, like something unique. And I think that every team does something unique and something different. I'm curious to know what you feel would be something that you're doing now that maybe potentially other people eat in your office or other people in your, uh, in your area or, you know, you're with real. So maybe other people in your general area, like what, what is something that you're doing that you, you think you would attribute your team success to? Well, there are so many things, Kobe. Um, I would say, you know, when I think about why am I so successful? I think the main thing that I think about is that I'm just a really relatable person. I happen to be wearing a blazer on this particular show with you. Right. But like, this is not how I dress. My clients are super comfortable with me because I, they can tell that I'm a flawed person. Not that I'm not a professional and that I don't know my stuff because that becomes apparent. Once we start talking about real estate, my, my whole face changes, everything changes, but just my demeanor as a person and not to criticize any agents that are a lot more fancy than me, because I always look at them and I go, damn, they look good. But when I show up to show houses, I'm usually very casual. My clients can relate to me, whether they're first time home buyers or they're millionaire clients. I'm just there to like show them that showing them the home isn't what I'm doing for them. What I'm doing is I'm the master negotiator for them. Anybody can open the door. So when they see me, they're kind of like, okay, she's not wearing a suit. But then when we start to talk about the process, they're like, oh crap, she's wearing Jordans, but like she can really, you know, work this out for us and knows all of the details. So I think I just become somebody that's, that's one of my main superpowers for lead conversion. I'm relatable and I make people feel really comfortable with just me and my personality and my team. I tell them, be yourself. You're going to attract the people that are like you because that's what I do. And if they're not like you, you're not going to mesh anyway. You're not going to have a good time in the transaction. No one is. And I think that's a huge thing with real estate. I hear, a, I listen to a lot of uh, live appointment calls because uh, we have a call center. So, you know, I, I hear a lot of agents just lacking confidence in their ability to have conversations with people. And it then makes me scratch my head and say, okay, like if this is how you are when you first meet me, how are you going to represent me when you are at the negotiation table trying to get me the home I want at the price I want with the terms I want? I'm curious, like you had mentioned, one of the things being like you being like you, something you're really good at is negotiation. What are some things that like when you are working with your team to help them be more confident confident in their negotiation skills, which like you're saying, and I hear a lot of top agents say that. A lot of top agents, top performing team leads say, I'm a master negotiator. A, what do you think that means? And B, how does somebody become a good negotiator? Okay, so here's, this is a thing that I have learned, you know, the the top agents, the one thing that they're doing is they're not only dealing with a lot of clients, we're dealing with a lot of agents, right? Our peers. 
And that's a huge thing that I have come in the last couple of years. It's like, how is this guy even working on the other side of the deal? Like when, when I go, the first thing I do, I've got my client in mind, but I'm talking to that other agent, like, let's make this win-win. Let's make this a cool 30 days for both of us. Like, what does your person need? Here's what my person needs. I'm going to be super straightforward with you. And we're going to talk about this. We're not just going to text. So that's, that's one thing I tell my team is super important. Like when they are making the appointments, have you called the agent? Have you asked if there's other offers? If they say there's other offers, have you asked what those other offers are? You got to talk. You can't just go show vacant properties just because they're vacant. Don't waste your client's time. There could be other offers. Call the other agent, talk to the other agent, form the relationship because I have had agents pick me over better offers because they want to work with me because they like my personality. That's a huge, that, that's where all the negotiating starts, the very first phone call. So that's what I try to teach them. You call and you make, you guys make best friends because you're going to be, be, you got to be best friends for 30 days or it's going to suck for everyone. That's, a, that's the biggest thing. I, I think you nailed the hammer on the nail there. Like, I think that far too many agents ostracize themselves in this industry where you need to not just shake hands and kiss babies with clients. You need to kiss babies and shake hands with other agents. How do you foster relationships with agents outside of the, because I, I hear I hear this a lot where it's like, you know, one of my good friends, Andrew Perry talks about, you know, agent to agent referrals, like 90% of his business is literally agent to agent referrals. Um, this personal production, like how do you foster the relationship aside from calling and like, what are you doing outside of the transaction in order to make sure that you are, are you know, like you're, you're well respected in the industry and what should, what, like, what do you teach your team around, you know, connecting with agent to agent? other agents around agent to agent referrals. That's a, that's a little tougher because, you know, and I don't want to, I'm too busy. Um, a lot of people say that I'm too busy to keep it up, but you know, if I have, I don't do a whole lot to kind of keep the relationship going. And, and I mean, for the most part, I don't, I don't feel like a whole lot of other agents that I've done deals with are reaching out to me, but I can tell I keep all my text messages. So if I breached out before, I'm going to say like, Hey, Cody, let's see if we can make this one work. Remember, I was trying to get it done on 123 Maple Street. I do a little bit of that. But now that you're saying that, Cody, I feel like I should send everyone a $5 Starbucks gift card and be like, what are your listings? Let's help each other. The umpires for my listing. There, there are some things that I could get better at for sure. And I'm not doing that. So thank you for bringing that to my attention. I got to get better at that. Oh, well, no, and that was, that, that was not the purpose of the question. The purpose I'm of the like, question. Dang. I know. The purpose of the question was to see kind of what you're doing, like, you know, as a successful team lead, but like, I, and, and I appreciate your vulnerability more than anything, because I think that no matter what we do, we all, we always have blind spots in our, in, in our business. Now, when like, let's go a little bit deeper into blind spots, because I'm really curious to chat up because like you're consistently doing coaching, like what, what should, because we all have blind spots as agents, as entrepreneurs, as business owners, when you're coaching uh, somebody on your team. How do you get them to, how do you get them to understand or how do you get them to really like identify what their blind spot is and help them work on the thing that might be holding them back from getting them to where they want to go, both personally and professionally? I, my mind was going on what I need to do on to reach out to other agents that I've worked with and just tell them how appreciated they are because we do have, I feel like one of the most stressful and really unappreciated professions out there. Uh, but what I do to help my agents. Uh, so what uh, we do is, and sometimes we get off on tangents where we just are working, working, working. But for the most part, I try to have one-on-ones where they tell me their top three goals of what they want to do. And I don't make the goals. And I tell them, listen, we can push this down from you know 24 transactions to 12. This isn't my goal. This is your goal. And just remember, I, I have, I do have a reputation of writing my agents. I just heard the other day, but the reason that I ride my agents is because why the heck would you want to hire a personal trainer who you're supposed to, and I'm just going to use a food analogy here. Why would you hire a personal trainer who was like, yay, you ate McDonald's. That's so great. Like you didn't lose any weight, but like, yay, like let's go. When, when people join my team, I tell them, 
that's not going to be me. You're going to tell me your goal. And then if you're not meeting your goal and you're not doing the exercises and homework that I give you to meet that goal that you set for yourself, it's going to be tough. So when we go back to visit those goals, I'm like, okay, you said you wanted to close this many fields. We are not on track. You said to me you were going to post five times a week. We are not on track there. You said to me you wanted to do this. Should we take this away from your goal? Like, that's okay. Like, let's make this a priority. Let's switch things around. And so I just take everything that they've told me and I put it in front of them and I say, okay, like I've been trying to hold you accountable to this. This isn't working. So what do we need to change so that this is better? Or if you want to stick to these goals, let's make an outline. I can text you and remind you. I right now, my team has a little, you know, bullet point that we're supposed to be sending out every night. How many hours have you worked on lead conversion? How many, uh, how many conversations have you had? How many social media posts? And is your CSU up to date? Because we use CSU as an accountability tool. So each agent is supposed to post that on our team thread. So I, I just use heavy accountability. Like if you're not doing that, you, you know you didn't. And there's a little voice in your head that's going to go, I didn't do that today. Yeah, you know, there's a level of accountability with any team that you build. And I think a lot of like, and I've heard this being, and I love that you do that. And it goes to show, you know, success leaves clues. And I've heard a lot of team leads over the last like little while say, you know, I just don't want to rock the boat, but it's the accountability that allows people to grow. Uh, you know, if you just keep letting them go down the path that they're going down, they're not going to experience the growth that they want to experience and you're not going to be happy. They're not going to be happy. Accountability is absolutely key. Wrapping up here, Angie, um, if somebody were to want to reach out to you, maybe it's an agent to agent referral, maybe they want to learn a little bit more about what you're doing. Uh, I know you're with Real. Maybe they want to learn a little bit more about Real. Uh, where is the best place we can kind of direct them to have a conversation with? My Instagram, unfortunately, like I'm an Instagram addict. So if they want to DM me on Instagram, I'm usually on there like four or five times a day because I'm trying to, you know, real drafts and I'm in there. So that's probably the best way um, to get a hold of me. And I'm happy to help with anything. Angie, I want to say thank you to the bottom of my heart for uh, joining us today to chat a little bit about lead conversion and team building and all that good stuff. So uh, just thank you so much for sharing your knowledge with us. And I want to say thank you for tuning into another episode of the Our Agent Podcast. We'll see you soon. 